other than today, the second Sunday in Lent, but here again in Sparta, or Augusta, in New Jersey here. And the epistle for this second Sunday in Lent is taken from St. Paul's first letter to, Thess letter to the Thessalonians, chapter 4. Brethren, we pray and beseech you in the Lord Jesus, that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, so also you would walk, that you may abound the more. For you know what precepts I have given to you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the passion of lust, like the Gentiles that know not God, and that no man overreach nor circumvent his brother in business, because the Lord is the avenger of all these things, as we have told you before and have testified. For God hath not called us into uncleanness, but into sanctification in Christ Jesus our Lord. And in the Gospel, taking that according to St. Matthew, chapter 17. At that time, Jesus took Peter and James and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into the high mountain apart. And he was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his garments became white as snow. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elias, talking with him. And Peter answering said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. And as he was yet speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and lo, a voice out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And the disciples, hearing, fell upon their face and were very much afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said to them, Arise and fear not. And they lifted up their eyes, saw no one but only Jesus. And they came down the mountain from the mountain, as they came, and as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man, so the Son of Man be risen from the dead. That's why the words of today's Holy Gospel. So today a few considerations. On the second Sunday at Lent, on the mystery of this transfiguration of our Lord. Throughout the Sundays of the world, we have the Feast of Transfiguration that comes in August. Now this is the day that Transfiguration is brought up in the sacred liturgy as part of the liturgical year. And it is not chosen by the church that this be done during the season of Easter or the season of Christmas or the season of Pentecost, which are more joyful seasons. But in the season of Lent, the season of penance. And that, there, that the Transfiguration is uh, a miracle. Or, excuse me, it's not a miracle. St. Thomas Aquinas points out that our Lord Jesus Christ performed many miracles. The transfiguration was not one of them. It is simply the normal, natural state of the body of Jesus Christ. When the divine word enters into a human flesh and becomes hypersatically united to it, so that you have two persons in one, two nature in one person, that human nature, which is united to the divine person of the God the Son, naturally emits a most beautiful light naturally is transfigured in the most magnificent beauty that's the natural normal state of our lord jesus christ human body so that when saint peter saint james and john saw him in that transfigured state for a few hours on top of the mountain of the transfiguration they just saw his natural normal condition and when he came down the mountain and he hid that state that was the miracle the miracle was that jesus christ was looked as an ordinary man just like it's, it, it's, it is a part of the miracle of the Blessed Sacrament that Jesus Christ is body and blood and soul divinity in a host. And part of the miracle of that transfiguration or transubstantiation, uh, the part of the miracle of that transubstantiation is that it still looks like bread, and yet it is the body and blood of Christ. When, our, when, when Jesus Christ's human body shone, nat shone without the light, without the brightness, that was the miracle. But it was not a miracle that he was transfigured before the apostles. He allowed St. Peter, James, and John to see him in his transfigured state. And this is a sign to us about there are many truths concerning God. And God reveals his truth to everyone. 
He reveals that he is God. Everyone knows that. Everyone will be exposed to that truth. He reveals that he is the judge. And everyone knows that truth. He reveals also that he shall, if we obey, obey his laws, we shall receive eternal happiness in heaven. If we disobey his laws, we shall receive eternal damnation in hell. If we die unrepentant. All men know these things. But there are some things that can only be known to the just. Just like when you go to a math class, everyone goes to kindergarten and first grade math class, knows that 1 plus 1 is 2 and 2 plus 2 is 4. Well, not everyone knows calculus. Not everyone knows the depth of geometry. So that those who go deeper in math who understand geometry and, and, the, and the, 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 the formulas and so on of geometry, they'll understand calculus. But those, everyone comes into contact with simple math. But not everyone knows calculus. Not everyone knows the geometry. And so, likewise, everyone will know God. Everyone will see God. Everyone will understand God in the basics. But to see the inner nature of God, to see his inner beauty, this requires justice in the soul and the heart. It requires study. One does not simply uh, learn the details of calculus and the depth of geometry and advanced math by just studying what one plus one is. And you can't know that in the beginning, but over time you can learn it. And yet it's always true. Geometry is always true. And calculus is always true. But we do not always see it ourselves because of our lack of education. And so likewise, this mystery of the transfiguration is always the normal condition of Jesus Christ and his humanity. And the beauty of Christ on that mountain, his communication with Moses and Elias, is his daily communication. His beauty and magnificence in heaven is his normal state, but not everyone will see it. God reserves certain things only for the just. He allowed Peter, James, and John to come to the top of the mountain. It was not yet St. Peter, not yet St. James, not yet St. John, but they were going to become St. Peter, St. James, and St. John. And when Peter, James, and John came to the top of the mountain, he chose Peter to see the transfiguration because he is the first pope and the head of the apostles, and he will be the one who is the guardian of truth, and he sees the transfiguration. And St. James will be the first martyr, the first of the apostles to die a martyr's death, and the apostle of Jerusalem. And St. John is the first beloved of the apostles. So those who are not ready to suffer for Christ, and those who are not ready to make Christ the center of their lives, and those who do not love him, they shall not see Christ transfigured. Those that know Christ make center of their lives and it makes them rule their lives are like a new Saint Peter. Those that are ready to live the life of Christ and suffer a little something for our faith, they are like unto Saint James. And those that love God above sin are like unto Saint John. And so Peter, James, and John see Christ transfigured, but the other apostles do not. And there are many souls that are baptized, many souls that are priests, many souls that are in the Catholic faith they will never see Jesus Christ transfigured. They will be around miracles. They will be around beautiful sights. They will have so many mysteries and beautiful things right in the presence of their eyes, but they will not see them, and they shall be blinded. And why are they blinded? Because of their own sins and because of their refusal to respond to the grace of God. And here, Peter, James, and John, they are not yet saints. They see Jesus Christ on top of the mountain. After they see him on top of the mountain, they are so filled with happiness and excitement, they want to tell everyone what they have seen. But our Lord Jesus Christ says, no, you don't tell anyone until after the crucifixion and the resurrection. You say nothing until after the Son of Man be risen from the dead. And they were obedient to him. They did not understand how many people should have converted how many people should have really believed if only they had seen Christ transfigured and heard that he was transfigured and that he was seen in all his glory before he died? He told them, no. You do not tell anyone until after the resurrection. Now the reason for this transfiguration has to do with the mystery of consolation. We all know that we're going to experience troubles in our lives if we follow God. Like it says in sacred scripture, the just man has... has uh, the sorrows of the just man are many. So if you follow Jesus Christ, if you want to live the truth, and you try to live a good life, you will have many sorrows. 
But the second part of that verse is, but the sorrows of the fool are infinite. So if you are a just man, you have many sorrows. But if you are a fool and follow Satan, you will have an infinite number of sorrows. And we see this in the lives of the saints versus the lives of the sinners. So in the lives of the saints, they have many difficulties and many trials. But as it says in many places in Scripture, and as it says many times in the lives of the saints, there are many trials for the just man, but the just man overcometh every one of them. And that God allows them to experience many trials, but they are experienced that they might be overcome. So the trials are temporary. The trials are not as big as the victories of the saints. But the, so the sinner, he begins his miserable life here below, and his misery increases and increases and increases. His unhappiness is more and more and more until eventually he goes to eternal perdition in hell. And so the sorrows of the just man are many, but the sorrows of the fool are infinite. And that's on the negative side. But there is also a positive side. And the positive side is, there shall be consolations for the just. If we follow God, there shall be trials, there shall be tribulations, but there shall also be great consolations. We're going to experience consolations. And Lord Jesus Christ allowed that for his own humanity. St. Augustine gives the example of 40 days in the desert. Our Lord Jesus Christ has 40 days in the desert. He was hungry. The devil came and gave him the three temptations. And at the end of the three temptations, Christ was both hungry in his humanity, he still fasted 40 days, and he was exhausted from fighting the devil. He was exhausted from a battle, and he was hungry from the lack of food. And what happened? The angels came in the desert and ministered to him. And they set a table in the desert, and they served him food. They served him meat, and they served him a great feast, a physical feast of food cooked in heaven that was brought to our Lord Jesus Christ. And he sat at a table in the desert, and the angels ministered to him, and he ate and was strengthened. Had he, had he a follow, a followed for the temptation of the devil and turned the loaves into bread, he would have had a lesser meal. But because he overcame that temptation, he was not only given the victory of overcoming the devil, but he was also given a better meal. And this will be experienced many times in the lives of the saints. That when they give up a, an apparent and brief pleasure for the sake of God, they will be given greater pleasure and a greater gift later on in this life. Like our Lord Jesus Christ himself said, you will receive a hundredfold here below. Part of that hundredfold is the mystery of consolation. We must experience it if we follow God from time to time. We know also the greater is the sorrow that God will let us experience because we are trying to follow him in a greater way so will also be the much greater consolations. The greatest of all, for instance, is St. Paul. He was a greater apostle than Peter, James, and John. And St. Peter, James, and John, they saw Christ transfigured once on top of a mountain in his glory. But St. Paul, what do we learn about him? Remember when his conversion happened, Ananias was going to anoint St. Paul, and Ananias was told, you must go and anoint St. Paul and cure his eyes, cure him of blindness. And he said, it's not just a great persecutor. But then our Lord said, this is the vessel of election. He is the vessel of election. That's what God himself calls St. Paul. And I will show him what he must suffer for my name. He speaks of St. Paul suffering more than the other 12 apostles. And so he did. So many sufferings he experienced before his final beheading at the end of his days on the same day that St. Peter would be crucified. And he experienced more sufferings than the other apostles. But what did he also experience? Remember what St. Paul himself says, I know a man 14 years ago, whether in the body or out of the body I know not, that such a one was taken up to the third heaven to hear things forbidden for man to hear. He saw and he used to see things forbidden for man to see. Of such a one I show glory, but of myself I show glory in nothing. St. Paul was taken up into heaven he was elevated into the clouds, and he saw in his elevation, higher than the Mount of Transfiguration, more beautiful things in a more beautiful way than even St. Peter, St. James, and John. So though he experienced many great sufferings, he also had incredible gift of consolation. And God never leaves the heart completely abandoned when we're going to suffer. He allows us to suffer. But even himself, on the day of his crucifixion, where he was left alone, 
Between the three hours of the agony and the coming of Judas, there was a brief gap, and the angels came and ministered to him, and he was comforted. During the course of his journey on the way to the cross, St. Veronica comforted him by wiping his face, and St. Simon comforted him by carrying the cross. Even though it was such a small thing, with all the agony Christ was experiencing, there was a relief of the carrying of the cross. And even the soldier, who didn't do the right thing, but at least he did something. He took wine, he took vinegar, and he and gall, and he put it out of a sponge, and he put it to the mouth of our Lord to give a little bit of, uh, of quenching of his thirst for a small amount. He tasted, but then he would not drink anymore. But he did taste a bit. And then, of course, the Blessed Virgin Mary was at the foot of the cross with our Lord. So there's going to, we're going to experience consolations if we remain faithful to our Lord, if we follow him, if we look for the truth. And remember that, that uh, if there's no consolation at all, or we don't believe there is, because oftentimes we only emphasize the desolation, if there's no consolation at all, then this is a sign that we're not following the law of God, that there's something wrong, and we must examine our consciences. And because when we consider the things of God, there shall come blessings. And furthermore, concerning consolation, Saint, our Lord Jesus Christ told St. Peter, St. James, and St. John, don't tell this vision to anyone until after the crucifixion and resurrection. And why is that? Because they don't understand. They do not understand the resurrection. I mean, they don't understand the transfiguration. But once they've experienced pain, and once they've seen Christ die on the cross, and once they've experienced the great joy of that incredible joy of the resurrection, then they will understand the value of the transfiguration. Then it will be a strength for them to carry them through the tribulations that are to come upon them as they travel throughout the world in order to convert it to Christ. And so there must be consolation as well as desolation in the spiritual life. And the consolation of the supernatural consolation is not for everyone. The enemies of God who do not follow his grace, who do not follow his gospel, these things are hidden from their eyes. And remember our Lord himself said, I thank thee, Father, that these things are hidden from their eyes. He didn't just want us to see God, but those that are of the world, who have the spirit of the world inside of them, who have the spirit of the flesh inside of them, and don't like the things of God. He blinds them, and he does not want to, it does not allow them to see the gifts of the things of God. But they're always available if we turn away from the life of sin and turn things back towards God. And remember also with regard to the martyrs. What do we see historically in all the life of the martyrs? When they go to their death, they're always happy. They're always filled with great joy. For instance, we find universally, when the martyrs go to death, they sing the Te Deum, which is the greatest hymn of thanksgiving in the church. Te Deum Laudamus. They don't sing the Miserere, the hymn of, of, of mercy and, and begging for forgiveness. They don't, say, they don't sing hymns of, 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 the, of, the, of the Requiem Mass. They sing the hymn of thanksgiving that with the angels sing in front of heaven. And this is the universal response that they sing the hymns of thanksgiving. They sing the hymn of, of Te Deum, and they are thinking of the things of God. And as St. Thomas More once said to his daughter, she was trying to convince him, don't die by the hand of the King Henry VIII. Sign the paper, and then you can be left to go and be free. And as he was talking to his daughter in, 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 the, uh, in the Tower of London, Carthusians were brought by the window of the tower. And they were on their way to be put to death at the Tyburn tree. They were being dragged backwards with their heads on the ground and dragged by their feet by the horses to be, to be hung, drawn, and quartered. And there were to be experienced a long death. And as they were on their way being drugged, says, see, you, you see Meg, the name of the daughter of Thomas More, look at them, see how they are. It is as though they're going to a wedding. They were filled with such joy as they were being dragged that they were singing and they were expressing the greatest human joy that can be experienced by human beings. They were so absolutely happy. And as you look at those of the Carthusians, they're on their way to be killed by Henry VIII. They're on their way to be hung to the Tyburn tree. They're going to be cut into pieces by the horses. They're going to have uh, the, the hooks dig into their, in their bowels and they're going to be dragged for a mile uh, two miles along the road, along the rocks in their present condition. And they are going to a wedding. Now you must remember 
God allows us to experience consolation in this life in order to help us to persevere through the times of difficulty. And we must also remember that the, when we experience difficulties and crosses, they are preparations for victory. The preparations for a great victory. A great victory is coming upon us. And so in our present crisis at the church, it seems to, that, that desolation is increasing. That seems to be increasing. And yet, what does our Lord say? When you see the mountains fall down, and when you see here are wars and rumors of war, and when you see, they are saying, peace, peace, and there is no peace, and you see nations fighting against nations, and the families turning out, turning the brother and the sisters, turning each other in, and death and persecution everywhere, lift up your heads and rejoice, because your redemption is at hand. And as St. Thomas points out, the things that cause the sinners to rejoice... It doesn't make sense. They should be the same things that cause the just man to rejoice. And therefore, on the flip side, it should also be true. The things that bring sorrow to sinners, they should not make sorrow to the just. And so, therefore, we should not be so sorrowful that we experience tribulations. One of the mistakes that is often made in the spiritual life is that when we have troubles, you, you, uh, you lose your house, you, you lose your job, you, there's, a, there's a, this travel, troubles in the family. We say, the Lord did this to me because of my sins. The Lord did this to me because I deserve punishment and that I'm making reparation for my sins. I deserve it, I deserve it. Now, it's true that we deserve it, it's tr but it is not true that it's given as a punishment. God reserves his punishment for hell. He does not punish us in this life. Sin is its own punishment in this life. He does not need to punish sin. Sin is its own punishment. You get drunk, and you'll find you have liver disease. God doesn't cause liver disease, the drunkenness does. You know, you live a life of violence, you find that you're threatened, and you're going to die, be, or somebody's going to murder you. That's what happens when you live a life of violence. And so on and so on, with all the sins. Each one has its own punishment. These punishments come from sin. God does not punish sin in this life. What he does in this life, he lets us experience some sufferings. He lets us experience some tribulations in order to make us come to him. In order to teach us his love. This is the way he, he quote-unquote punishes in this life. God reserves his actual punishment for the next life. We can offer up the pains we experience for our sins. But God does not make us suffer for our sins in this life. He rather... May he lets us suffer that our hearts might turn to him and that from this suffering we might get a higher place in heaven and turn the wrath of God away from sinners. And not now, but in the time to come. And so in any case, the transfiguration is a great blessing, not for all, but for the just. And the unjust shall never see Christ transfigured, but they shall see his wrath. They shall see his face when he says, Depart from me, ye cursed and everlasting fire. In any case, the perseverance of the battle... And, and remember that the goodness of God is what rules in this life, and then and, and, and thank God for the consolations He has given to us, and then and, and then continue to love Him, persevere through the troubles and trials that are to come, because they are the foundation of our glory. Closing up with you all, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.